There's a solitary, humble, wooden structure on a windswept hill in rural New England. To open the door is to engage our minds, our hearts, and our imaginations. In this place, preachers and professors, past and present, come alive as they walk the aisle, ascend the pulpit stairs, and teach. From theology, from history, and from the Word of God, welcome to the Saybrook Meeting House, an audio production of Saybrook Ministries. Study to prepare for this paper, I began to realize that in no way at all in the amount of time that's allotted here can we really do justice to covering uh, the life of this man and his ministry. So possibly some of you will be disappointed if I don't dwell on maybe some particular aspect of his life, such as his early training or uh, his particular ministry in Liverpool, but we're going to try to give a, an overview of, of this man and of his ministry and what he believed and, and what he left behind him. So I've broken down this paper into five different points. First, his birth and early years leading up to his conversion, 1816 to 1837. Secondly, the events leading up to his call to the ministry, 1838 to 1841. Then an extended period of 39 years in which we would see him as the country minister, 1841 through 1880. And we'll dwell a little bit upon some of the places of his service during that time, Exbury, Winchester, Helmingham, and Stradbroke. Now, uh, I was talking to Brother Payne earlier and I said, I'm probably going to butcher a lot of these towns and, uh, and cities. Uh, as you, the way you pronounce them, but bear with me because uh, I've heard some Canadians speak about uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and, uh, and St. Louis, Missouri. Or uh, how would you like to be thrust into a place and try to pronounce a name of a town that's spelled P-O-Q-O-S-O-N? When we moved to Virginia, I began to call that place Pocason. And people immediately corrected me and said, no, it was Pocosin. And it was just a little bit different. But uh, it's difficult to pronounce some of these names if you're not familiar with them. So bear with me as I go through the historical aspects of this. Fourthly, we're going to see him as the first bishop of Liverpool, 1880 to the time of his death in 1900. And then we're going to consider a few things concerning the legacy that he left behind with some special mention of his books and tracts. So, we begin by looking at his birth and early years leading up to his conversion. Let's try to set the scene of where J.C. Ryle came uh, to be born. The little village of Macclesfield. I got that pronunciation correct, I believe. Macclesfield. I just checked with Bill this morning to be sure on that one, so I know. But this was found in the uh, county of Cheshire. Macclesfield lies in the shadow of the Peak District, the large and beautiful upland area of central England. To the west, the sweeping pastures of Cheshire, and to the east, the sharp rise of hills toward Buxton. Macclesfield was known as a village uh, of industry. Early in its existence, it became a center for the silk trade. That began in the 16th century. But in the 1790s, when weaving began to come into being, the city began to really grow. And it was at this time that many huge rectangular mills were set up and the town became a mill town. For approximately 21,000 population in the city in the 1790s, and of that population, approximately 10,000 of them were employed in the mills. Now, you might say, well, that's a high percentage out of 21,000 for 10,000 to be employed in the mills, but we must remember that children were sent to work from the age of seven, 
And the people spent long hours and there was low income. And this created very brief family life for these people. They were constantly at work. To try to set it into a frame of history, we're thinking about the time now when we're going to be picking up with looking into this of the Battle of Waterloo, 1815. The town experienced uh, rapid growth and, and some measures of prosperity. There were some ups and downs in it, but in 1824, a recession struck the town when the import duties were removed. Approximately 6,000 people were laid off at this time, and there were many bankruptcies among the owners of the mills. But tracing back into the Ryle family, they were spared this uh, matter of going into bankruptcy. God's hand was upon them even at that in their, in their secular life. Now, we'll be speaking about a number of John Riles. There's a John Riles Sr. who was J.C.'s grandfather. And then there was another one who was called John Ryle Sr. And then, of course, John Charles Ryle was born. So we want to try to keep distinguishing these men apart. Now, John Ryle, who would be his grandfather, John Ryle of Park Green in the center of Macclesfield survived the collapse in 1824. And you can trace the, the Ryle family name back to the time of the Norman Conquest. John Ryle Sr., this would be the grandfather, was a major landowner acquiring large tracts of farmland toward the end of the 18th century. He was a member of a much maligned society of Wesleyans who later became known as Methodists. John Wesley's first visit to the area was on November 8, 1745, and he came regularly after that until about 1790. On his first visit to Macclesfield, the meeting took place in what was called a bakehouse of a farm. Now, I don't really know what that was, but I would presume it was a place where baking was done, where there were brick ovens of some kind, and, and it would be a larger room. And that was where Wesley's first meeting was held in that village of Macclesfield. Underneath his ministry there, there were a number of people who were converted under his very first sermon and included amongst those who were converted at that first time was a lady who was to have a great amount of influence in the conversion of John Ryle Sr. This lady was his mother. So this would have been J.C.'s great-grandmother. In 1782, Wesley preached to 1,300 people in this village of Macclesfield. And John Ryle Sr., became a follower of Wesley's teaching and he provided the land for a Methodist chapel to be built in the center of town on Sunderland Street. Now, John Ryle Sr. died in 1808 and the family fortune was passed on to his son, John, who was one of eight children. This would be J.C.'s father. His fortune was passed on to John. He was the most prominent of eight children Within a year after his father's death, he became the mayor of Macclesfield. He was married to Susanna, and he lived in a large house on Park Green, commonly known as Riles Park. And it was into this house at 4 a.m. in the morning on May 10, 1816, that there was born a son who was given the name of John Charles Ryle later to become known by most people as J.C. Ryle, and as he's referred to today as J.C. Ryle. Now, the family remained here at this lovely home in town, this house, Park House, until John Charles was age eight. And then there began a breaking up of the family. They did not move out of the house, but when I say a breaking up, at age eight, John Charles was sent to a private school run by the Reverend John Jackson, who was the vicar of Over. This was a small village about 20 miles away. Now, you have to imagine uh, the experience now of a boy of age eight. Some of you here have children, boys of age eight. And can you imagine uh, how your son 
would fare if at age eight you sent him away to a school 20 miles away. Now, that was a lot of, you know, that was a rather large distance to be away in those days. You can imagine how a boy of eight was affected by this. There were 16 other boys at the school and they were all herded into two rooms. They slept eight in a room. John Charles was not happy at the school at all. He did not like the experience that he found there. He was somewhat abused by some of his fellow classmates. On one occasion, they put him into a blanket and they began to throw the blanket up and down. You know how to do that and bouncing him up and down and he happened to fall out of there and he landed on his head and he received a concussion. And he was very unhappy being at this place. As you can well imagine. <laughs> Academically, the school had many, many defects. It was said that when the Reverend Jackson, Jackson was about his parochial duties, the students were left to run wild through the countryside, stuffing themselves with green apples. Now you can imagine what kind of problems that created. <laughs> During school holidays, he spent his time back at his home in Macclesfield as a typical boy doing typical boy things. On many occasions, he would climb into a hayloft with some apples and a good book. And even at a very young age, reading became one of the main pursuits throughout his life. He left what might be called his prep school in 1827 at age 11 afterwards claiming to have learned more evil in that brief spell there than he had done in the rest of his life. In his autobiography, he states, quote, the first school a boy goes to when he leaves home is the most important thing in his life. He went on to declare that parents who thought that the first prep school was of little importance for a boy so long as he went to a good public school afterwards were, quote, Nothing better than short-sighted, foolish, unintelligent geese. Now let's move on then to the next period of time in his life from 1828 to 1834. At the beginning of 1828, John Charles was sent to Eton College across the River Thames from Windsor Castle. The school was founded in 1440 by Henry VI. Eaton's curriculum had not changed substantially for a hundred years when Ryle arrived there. There was little more than Homer, Virgil, and Horace, and a subsidiary source of education in the private tutors who had no official connection with the school at all. Religion, too, had very little to commend it at Eaton. The Sunday sermons in chapel were as he stated, mumbled and jumbled by old men with weak, smothered voices. Light relief came in small doses, such as the time a bald preacher gave us his text, My sins are more than the hairs of my head. Ryle later noted that most of the boys knew far more about heathen gods and goddesses than about Jesus Christ. Ryle loved sports. He was quite a, uh, even from his youth, he was a, a large boy and, and grew up into a very big man. Large stature. Some, there's different uh, statistics quoted about him, but I think we could safe to say that in his adult years he was probably somewhere around 6'3 to 6'4" and a goodly man. But he loved sports, and especially cricket, which was then in its infancy. Now, I didn't know an awful lot. I, I don't know an awful lot about cricket, but I'm, next year when you bring the equipment who is ever bringing it, I'll be glad to show you how to play it. But uh, contrary to what some were telling me about his excellence on a cricket field, records that are kept, now this is serious, records that are kept about the, the matches, I guess that's what you'd call them, that he participated in while he was at Eton, revealed that in the two matches that were recorded, and these are kept in something that's called Lord's Record Book. Now, I don't know about that, Bill. You would know maybe? All right. Well, in those about two matches that were held with Oxford, uh, he scored, now you're going to have to, I don't know how he's scoring, but let me give you the statistics here. 
He had a two and seven in the first game, taking a few wickets. Now, what that... <laughs> that means nothing to me. I have no idea what that means at all. But that's, that's what he did. In the second match, he had a five and zero. Now, again, I, don't, I have no idea, but from what I understand, that was not a very impressive uh, statistic. And just as a little off you too, let me just tell you, you know, that cricket was an American game. That's right. There was a man by the name of James M. Cricket who invented it game. And then you stole it. The English stole it and took it over there. But cricket is an American game. It will always be remembered. And we've given to that man the honor. And he's, he's gone down in history. His name is Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> Now, Ryle spent his holidays at home while he was schooling at Eton. He didn't uh, go off, as you might think a young boy would, and, and try to find uh, excitement in other places. He would always gravitate back to his home. And he used to spend the evenings dancing or playing cards. He was fond of all sorts of dancing, and as he said, anything that had steam and life and go in it, he was interested in. Summing up his time at Eton, Ryle said that he valued those years for teaching him that he could not always have his own way and how to get on with other people. Leaving in 1834, he went to Ireland for a holiday, and then he came back to go up to further pursue his education to Christ Church, Oxford. Oxford, 1834 to 1837. A typical day for Ryle began at approximately 7 a.m. when he and another large group of men would try to crowd into very crowded quarters to wash up. After that came chapel and a divinity lecture before breakfast. After breakfast, lectures in Greek and Latin took up most of the morning hours. Afternoons were free for sports when he pursued his his uh, liking of cricket and also of rowing. Dinner was served on, a, on the average day about 5 o'clock in the afternoon and the day ended in chapel at 9.15 p.m. with prayers being spoken in Latin as they were in the morning chapel. He took an instant dislike to Oxford society as he found it and he complained about the idolatry of money and aristocratic connection. He found himself in the old world of privilege and he despised it. Although leaving with high academic honors, he confessed he was, quote, very glad to get away from it. And it was some 30 odd years before he ever went back and visited Oxford again. It would be at Oxford that he would come face to face with one of the great crises of his life. At Oxford, he came under the influence of the minority of evangelicals at Oxford. While there, he studied the 39 articles of the faith, the prayer book, and church history. And by oral examination, he had been tested in his knowledge of these things. Now, the evangelicals were unwavering Anglicans, loyal to their church because of its Protestant doctrine as set out in the 39 articles, and because of the great freedom that was afforded in the preaching of the gospel. It was estimated that by 1830, one in every eight Church of England clergy was an evangelical. Ryle had been brought up to regard these as, quote, well-meaning, extravagant, fanatical enthusiasts who carried things a great deal too far in religion. In 1815, Henry Ryder was the first evangelical to be appointed a bishop. He was the Bishop of Gloucester. In 1828, J.B. Sumner was likewise appointed a bishop. He was another evangelical. J.B. Sumner, in 1848, became the first evangelical to become Archbishop of Canterbury. Other evangelicals were found in strategic places. Charles Simeon at Cambridge, 
John Venn at Clapham, and Thomas Robinson at Leicester. While at Eton, Ryle had been confirmed in the Church of England, but it had meant little to him. So various other factors combined at this time in his life to produce in him an evangelical conviction under God. One of those factors was that in Macclesfield there was a new church built, largely due to the generosity of the Ryle family. This was St. George's. As I said, the land was given by his father and John Charles attended there during the holidays. The ministry there was thoroughly evangelical. There were two ministers who, used, who were used of God to teach Ryle the essentials of the gospel, justification by faith and new birth by the Holy Spirit. Another factor in Ryle's road to conversion was the effect of this ministry at St. George upon some of the members of his family. A cousin, a male cousin of his, uh, was converted under the ministry there, and this had quite a profound effect upon John Charles because he had known this cousin from before and had seen that he was quite a wild young man. And to see this great change struck him with the fact that there was something real about it. This even became more so when his sister Susan was converted. And it made him ponder deeply on the faith that they were evidencing in their life. An account is given that he was out shooting one day, out shooting birds one day, with an old Eton friend by the name of Algeron Coote. And there were others there with him, and Algeron Coote's father was with him. And Algeron Coote's father was a very keen uh, Christian man. And in the course of the day, uh, taking a shot at a bird, he missed the bird, which it was an easy shot and he should have had it, but he missed the bird, and he swore out loud in the hearing of his friends and in the hearing of, John, of Algernon Coote's father. And the father rebuked him sharply at that point. And he relates that from that day on, he never swore again. Although he did not become a Christian immediately, he was very much aware that his own standard of life and that of the Christians he knew were in sharp contrast. Thus, when the summer of 1837 came, the foundations had been laid for Ryle's conversion. Just before he was to take his final exams, he became very sick with inflammation of the chest. And his illness gave him more time to think. And the more he thought, the more he realized that Jesus Christ was not at the center of his life. Then one Sunday afternoon, he happened to go to a service in one of the parish churches. He remembered nothing particular about it, not even the sermon. But he did respond to the manner in which the scriptures for the second lesson were read. He never knew the name of the man who read the scripture. But the passage was from the second chapter of Ephesians. And when the eighth verse was read, the reader laid emphasis on it with a short pause between each clause. And so Ryle heard, by grace are ye saved. Through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. I might just say, if we ever think that God doesn't use the reading of the scriptures to bring people into conversion, here's the prime example. The man who, who was steeped in, in knowing truth and had been taught the truth. He had all of this down. He was able to pass oral examinations on, the, on all the thing about, his, about the faith, but there was nothing in his heart but just the simple reading of a verse punctuated by a pause was used of God to bring him to himself. And the same truth which had so transformed Luther in his discovery of justification by faith now had the same effect upon Ryle. And by the grace of God, he became a Christian. And about this time in his life, he became an avid reader. He devoured books. He devoured books on church history and the church fathers and just was eaten up with his reading of books. Now let's look at some of the events leading up to his call to the ministry during the period of time of 1838 to 1841. By the beginning of 1838, he had passed through the spiritual crisis of his life 
But now there came a material one. His family had acquired great wealth and property in Macclesfield. And after a short period of six months in London, John Charles returned home to take up a position in his father's bank. He entered wholeheartedly into the work and he looked forward to taking over this aspect of his father's enterprises along with all the rest of them. He became a county magistrate and he also became the captain of the Cheshire Yeomanry, which was a, sort of what I would call a militia group of about 600 men and he was a leader of that. He had many occasions to go out into the surrounding areas around Macclesfield and speak on political and religious matters. He was, by common consent, one of the most eligible young bachelors in the county, but he met no one who particularly attracted him. In order to try to get him married, his father offered him a house and 800 pounds if he would get married. But he turned it down. But spiritually, during this time, he was very dissatisfied because he was now engaged in total secular work. Worldly matters pressing down upon him caused him to uh, stray away from his uh, discipline in the things of the Lord. He received no encouragement from his parents. They tolerated his faith, but uh, he received no encouragement. And then this crisis came that was to alter again the course of his life and certainly for the good at this time. The bank that his father owned collapsed. This was due to bad financial decisions on the part of his father. Overnight, the royal fortunes disappeared. As John Charles put it in his autobiography, he said, we got up one summer morning with all the world before us as usual and went to bed that night completely and entirely ruined. All of the goods that the family had acquired over many years being passed down from one to another were sold to pay off the debts that they incurred. The lovely home there, Riles Park, the park house, had to be sold. And he said at this time, if I were not a Christian, I would have committed suicide. John Charles learned that Submission to God's will is perfectly compatible with intense and keen suffering under the chastisement of his will. He traced the family disaster back to the spiritual declension of his father. And it was at this time that he pondered what type of work he could now do. And it began to enter into his mind and into his heart whether possibly he could become a clergyman. This was not out of default. I can't find anything else to do and so I'll become a clergyman. But God began now to work. Stripped him of all the material wealth that was there and took away all of his aspirations of taking over his father's bank and, and eventually becoming uh, the rich landowner there and, and having all these various enterprises come into his. God took that all away from him. Stripped him of it. And it was then at that time that God began to deal with him and began to plant within his heart and his mind a deep desire and yearning to become a preacher. Now we have the extended period of time then, beginning 1841 to 1880. I call this the country ministry. He was ordained December 12, 1841, and he preached his first sermon on December 19th of that year. And so began a country ministry which was to cover 39 years in 1841, he became curate of Exbury, the parish of Foley. He described the place as, quote, dreary, desolate, and solitary, unquote. He had in his parish, the parish of Foley, approximately 400 people. The parish covered of seven square miles. It was known to be low land, oftentimes flooded, undrained land. And because of this, there was much sickness in the parish. On many occasions, John Charles was not just the spiritual physician to their souls, but also the literal physician to their, soul, to their bodies. And he would go out and administer different medicines to them. And he cared for them in a way which was to bring great uh, 
honor, in a sense, to him in the, in the following of the people after him, not just because he healed their bodies, but because they saw in this a deep, sincere, uh, and earnest uh, concern for them, both body and soul. And so the church there that had been for many years almost deserted with just a handful of people attending it soon became filled to capacity. But his stay in Exbury was fairly short. While he was there, his annual stipend for the year was a hundred pounds. Out of that, he was still paying off debts that had been incurred by his father. He did this for a number of years. For at least twenty years he was involved in out of his out of his salary to be paying off debts yet that that had been incurred, and it was many, many years later that he finally paid off, and there is recorded yet and I don't know who has it, but there is a, a note there that was the final payoff of the debt of, of that great collapse. And it was for some minute sum of money, just a few pounds and shilling, and that was it. And it was all over and done with. But the main reason for his leaving Exbury was due to the fact that uh, he suffered in his health being in that area as well. In November of 1843, he was offered St. Thomas in Winchester. This was the cathedral city of the diocese. And it was here that he came into contact with some of the high church fathers. It was here that he saw little to please him spiritually concerning the Anglican churches in that city. He said that the whole place is in a very dead state and worldliness reigns supreme in the cathedral. The church that he was assigned to was old and was neglected. But it wasn't too long until it was soon filled to its 600 capacity. He had been at St. Thomas for only five months when he received an unexpected offer to move to Helmingham in Suffolk. And it was to be there that he spent the 17 years of his country ministry. It was at this time that he met and married Matilda Charlotte Louisa Plumtree on October the 29th, 1845. You're laughing. That's a nice name. <laughs> Matilda Charlotte Louisa Plumtree. By his own words, he had found in Miss Plumtree, quote, a real Christian a real lady, and not a fool. It's nice. There was a child born of this marriage in June of 1847, given the name of Georgina Matilda. I can't spend time to, to uh, explain to you why he named the child Georgina, but just simply to say that God had used uh, a family very greatly in his life and the lady's name was Georgina. Her first name was Georgina and in honor to that lady who, who helped him tremendously in his spiritual growth, he, he named his firstborn child Georgina after her. Ten days after the girl was born, his wife took sick. Now, he blamed the illness on his mother-in-law who had, this is it, blamed the illness on his mother-in-law, who had come to stay with them for the birth. One morning, she had read her daughter 15 letters from well-wishers instead of allowing her a rest. Ryle came to the conclusion that, quote, mothers-in-law are seldom wise or add to the happiness of their daughters in reality. In June of 1848, his first wife died. Following on from the sickness of the birth of the daughter, she never recovered. And so for approximately two and a half years, he had an, a, a wife that was confined to the sickbed most of that time. And she died then in 1848, leaving him with one daughter. But he did not remain a widower too long, for on February 21st, 1850... He married Miss Jessie Elizabeth Walker. He had known uh, this lady for a number of years. In fact, Jessie Elizabeth Walker was his daughter's godmother. From this marriage, there were born four children, three sons and one daughter. 
in March of 1860, 10 years after they were married, a little less than 10 years after they were married, she contracted Bright's disease, which was kidney disease, and she died two months later. There was a great strain placed on J.C. Ryle during these years, and in his own words, he said, there is no position so trying in this world as that of a minister who is left a widower with a young family and a large congregation. It was at this time that he dropped the ornate manner of preaching that he used in his earlier days. He cultivated a simple but powerful style of his own, suited to the needs of the average working man. His sermons always ended with a practical application. And anyone who's read his books and read particularly, say, like the expository thoughts, see, he's a very, he gets right down to speaking to the average man. It's amazing how the books of J.C. Ryle, this is a little bit off where I am right now, but it's amazing how the books of J.C. Ryle appear to be so pertinent and so right to this day and age. When I was pastoring in Herkimer, New York, we had a, a small charismatic Bible school a few miles away from us, and students used to come down there. And one fellow came in one day, and he picked up one of Ryle's books, and he took it back and he read it. And he came back a couple of weeks later, he wanted to know if I could give him J.C. Ryle's address. He wanted to write to him. <laughs> and we laugh, but you know, that's true. When you read his writings, you think he's living. We have over on the table over there some of Tozer's books. You read Tozer's books and you think the man's living right now. You think he's writing about the, the situations of today. But he then became a true preacher rather than being... Uh, stifled by the ritualistic approach to preaching or the formality of preaching. He became a preacher in the full sense of it. The Spirit just released him and he became a powerful preacher in the pulpit. And coupling that with his physical stature, uh, he was indeed a man that, that commanded the attention of the people. Also during this time, his ministry through literature was begun. Uh, he had a friend there in Helmingham who for 50 years from the early days in 1840s there, for 50 years became a partner in literature with him. He published many, many tracts and books during this period of time. He published and distributed tracts. And it was at Helmingham that the expository thoughts on the Gospels was begun. He finished the Gospel of Matthew in 1856, Mark in 1857, Luke in 1859, and he finished John in 1873. And it was his hope that these volumes, the expository thoughts on the Gospels, would be found suitable for use at the family devotions of the average Christian family. As he said, they were intended to be plain and pointed, picked and packed. And if you read those little expository thoughts, you will agree that they are plain and pointed, picked and packed. His time at Helmingham was not without strife. There was a lot of uh, typical problems within the church, as any church has their problems over a period of years. He was not free from this. There were those who uh, attacked him for his strong evangelical stance and position that he took and he was then offered his living or to move his ministry to Stradbroke and so from 1861 to 1880 he was at Stradbroke in Suffolk one of the things that uh, took up some of the time there in fact eight years of the time there was the restoration of the church building now, as a pastor, you might say, wow, to be tied down with a church building project for eight years would be horrible. But more than just a restoration of a church building, his desire was to have a church building in such complete order that, would there, that there would be no fair excuse for introducing ornaments or fittings of an unprotestant character into that church at any time. And so he took great pain in overseeing the restoration of this church in removing some things out of it and adding some things into it. 
But as I said, it was his desire to see in this building it, it to become sort of a prototype of others to follow that would be plain without any attachments that would draw people away to look at the building and worship the building. No statues, no any drapes and, and ornaments hanging around. That was his desire. Because he was concerned is what he saw happening in many of the churches in the Anglican denomination, what he considered to be Roman ceremonials being introduced. In October of 1861, he married his third wife, Henrietta Claus. And she took over the care of his five children. It was said of her that she had a ready and a loving spirit, and she soon won over the affection of his children. Now, in the period of time, 1873-74, there came into England those maverick Americans, Moody and Sankey. And they began their evangelistic tours of Great Britain at that time. Now, Ryle had mixed feelings toward them. And although he became a personal friend of Moody and believed that his basic theology was acceptable, he was never entirely happy with the techniques of mass evangelism. Later, in later years, he, uh, he even met with Moody and was even on the platform with Moody. And he saw in Moody much that he could commend and much that he could agree with, but he never really uh, was happy with the tactics or the techniques of the mass evangelism that was being used. Now, he felt that the rest of his days would probably be spent at Stradbroke, and that's where he would finish out his, his career, his time in the ministry. And so he was extremely surprised to be offered the deanery of Salisbury by Lord Beaconsfield. This was offered to him in March of 1880 when he was 63 years of age. He accepted, hoping that the evangelical cause would profit by his promotion. And that is one thing we see about J.C. Ryle in his life. He had this earnest desire to see the evangelical cause promoted. And any time that he moved up a little bit, it was not for the benefit of himself. It was for the benefit of the evangelical cause. And I think to this we owe him a great deal of, of praise and honor for the fact that he did not consider himself. It was not his his own life and his own name that he was concerned about, but he was concerned in seeing the evangelical cause spread throughout the Church of England. This time at Stradbroke, the 19 years he was there, had been relatively good, harmonious years, and he left Stradbroke reluctantly. The people wept when he left there to move on. So at this point in time, then, we could say that the East Anglian ministry was now closed, the time that he spent in various churches in that geographical location. And it now would be that a national ministry was to begin. Ryle's ministry in Stradbroke had been the important base for a larger ministry, both on behalf of the evangelical cause and to the Church of England itself. Although he refused both Although he referred both to the evangelical school and to the evangelical party, there were no party headquarters from which instructions and information were sent out to card-carrying members. With the appearance of theological liberalism in the form of higher critical views of the Old Testament, and especially with the rise of the ritualist movement, many evangelicals from the early 1860s onward felt the need of a definite party machinery. In 1865, the London Church Association was, uh, came into being. In their statement of why they uh, came about, they said that this was to preserve the Protestant character of the church by opposing all forms of ritualism and all Romanist sacramental views. Ryle felt that the association could become the basis of a league of Protestant and evangelical churchmen. It was at this time that he wrote his book, Warnings to the Churches. Despite numerous attempts to unite, the evangelicals remained as before, unorganized, and as their opponents called them, nothing more than a bag of marbles. 
Ryle himself believed in the full inspiration and authority of the Bible, the sinfulness of man, the substitutionary atonement of Christ, and the inward sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And with reference to the doctrines relating to personal salvation, he certainly could be termed a Calvinist. He believed in and he taught the doctrine of election, the perseverance of the saints, but he did not teach a doctrine of limited atonement. He felt that the only way that a general preaching of the gospel to all people was possible was because Christ had provided in his death a general redemption. So he never held to the doctrine of limited atonement. Concerning ritualism, he said, I would rather see another civil war in England than the reestablishment of popery. He was an opposer of the fledgling Keswick movement. And he wrote his book, Holiness, as a rebuttal to the teachings of that movement. Though in later years, he also was found to be on their platforms. But he never could wholeheartedly endorse that movement. And never found himself close to the American followers of the Keswick movement that began to come to England to preach that particular form of teaching of the deeper, the spiritual life, the deeper life movement. It was at this time that many men would consider the end of their careers, retirement coming up, that God intervened and called John Charles Ryle to be the first bishop of the city of Liverpool. Some of the events leading up to his appointment in February of 1880, after six years of government, Lord Beaconsfield, better known as Benjamin Disraeli, went to the polls and he was utterly crushed. He suffered a crushing defeat. One of the things that I found in reading about Ryle and reading about all this, I didn't realize how much the political and the religious were merged together here and how appointments came by, by rule of the, of the kings or queens and, and political people. I didn't understand all of this. But just before handing over the office of prime minister to Gladstone, Lord Beaconsfield made sure that J.C. Ryle, who was the dean-elect of Salisbury, went to the new diocese of Liverpool as the first bishop. Queen Victoria appointed him after some political jockeying going on. Ryle came to Liverpool on April 26, 1880 to meet the bishopric committee, which had worked so hard for many years raising the finances needed to justify the foundation of this new bishopric. He stated very firmly at this first meeting with this committee that he was coming to Liverpool as a Protestant and evangelical bishop of the National Church, prepared to hold out the right hand of fellowship to all loyal churchmen, but at the same time would hold firmly to his own opinions. He would not be, quote, a milk and water bishop. His appointment was hailed with enthusiasm among the evangelicals. He was greeted with loud and prolonged cheering at the meetings of the British and Foreign Bible Society as well as the Church Missionary Society, at which meeting he responded, I thank you with all my heart for the kind and flattering reception you have given me. I tried to hold the fort for Christ during the past 35 years in the comparative seclusion of Suffolk, and I hope by God's grace to hold the same fort in the giant city of Liverpool. Now, I read and I conferred with Brother Payne about this, and, and uh, Liverpool actually at that time was the largest city in Great Britain. Uh, there were approximately 500,000 people living in the city of Liverpool. Now, someone here might say, as Brother Payne said, oh, no, 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 London was bigger. But uh, according to the writers that I looked at, uh, the city of London, without its suburbs, was smaller in population than the city of Liverpool without its suburbs. Now, London, it, the, the, the surrounding city of London had more people, yes, but the, the larger city, the greater city, the inner city, was Liverpool was bigger. Now, just at the same time that the evangelicals were thrilled with his coming to be the first bishop of Liverpool, 
So likewise, others were not so pleased with his coming. And the high churchmen rose up to attack him, both personally, his character, his ministries. Much of what Spurgeon uh, experienced by those in his early ministry. Something about the city of Liverpool. I ought to have Bill Payne up here because he's a, an old Liverpool man. But Liverpool had first been granted a charter by King John in 1205. There were approximately 77,000 people there in 1800, but by 1850 there were 400,000, and by 1900 approximately 750,000 people. Gradually it became the first port in the country, and by 1850 its trade was double that of the port of London, and virtually half that of the whole nation of Great Britain. One out of ten ships in the world came from Liverpool, this being due largely to the prosperous cotton trade. By 1875, the Mersey Riverside was dominated by seven and a half miles of docks. During the potato famine of 1845 and 46, nearly 400,000 Irish fled to Liverpool. By 1850, there were also about 40,000 Welsh people, many of them speaking no English. Also, there were a considerable number of Scots, Chinese, Jews, and blacks living in Liverpool. Now, into this hodgepodge of humanity came J.C. Ryle to be Liverpool's first bishop. Ryle was consecrated at York Minster by Archbishop Thompson on June 11, 1880. True to his reformed convictions, he refused to dress in the embroidered cope and mitre and carry a pastoral staff. Right from the very beginning of his ministry, he set forth the need of a new cathedral for Liverpool. This new diocese was the next to the smallest in the whole country. However, the small area was packed with people with an extraordinary variety of classes. Ryle sought to minister to these masses by the increasing of more clergy and lay workers. And he began more and more as time went on to put that cathedral aside and become more concerned in the masses of the people and meeting their needs. During the first ten years in Liverpool, he saw the completion of 27 new churches and 48 mission halls. At the hub of the diocese were the archdeacons. And for 20 years, for his entire ministry as Bishop of Liverpool, he consistently appointed only evangelicals to that office. Others were, were allowed to come in into lower offices, but archdeacons were consistently evangelicals by his appointment. But there were those who yet pressed for the cathedral project. And so... Committee work began for the Cathedral of Liverpool in 1883. And as so often happens amongst people, they began to bicker as to where this was going to be built. And so the whole issue became the site of the new cathedral. Many sites were discussed, but there was no agreement on it, and so it was tabled. And Ryle was not wholeheartedly in favor of this at all, of building this cathedral at this time. He was concerned that more smaller churches and more mission halls would be built. And in fact, the cathedral was not built in his lifetime. Speaking a little about that cathedral, my wife and I made our first trip over to Great Britain a few years ago, and we were privileged to spend a brief afternoon in Liverpool with Errol Hultz serving as our host. And when we met Errol, he said we came in on a train and he met us at the station. And he said, well, I'll take you to the coffee house. I should have Bill up here giving Errol's impersonation. But anyway, he said, well, I'll take you to the coffee house, to the largest coffee house in Liverpool. And he proceeded to take us over to the cathedral. And I don't know if any of you have been in there and, and you know, but the one whole side of the cathedral running back is kind of glassed in there, a whole big large area. It's glassed in and they got this restaurant like a cafeteria in there. And I, that's the first cathedral that uh, I had ever been in. And probably the last one I'd ever want to be in because it was so cold and so commercial. 
At the same time, where they got a coffee house running on the side, there were people out here with candles and other things going on and, and trying to worship in some sense. Tours going on and everything else. Well, this time of his being bishop was a period of many controversies. As I say, we could spend a lot of time on discussing these controversies, looking into some of his strong points, his standing up against the liberalism that was coming in, the ritualism that was coming in. We don't have the time to do that. But he was one who stated his position and maintained his position. And he was a thorough evangelical of a Protestant Reformed background. He refused to support secession by the evangelicals. There were many who said, let's pull out, let's get out of this, and let's start another, another church. But he refused to support secession by the evangelicals. And he said, so long as the articles and prayer book are not altered, we occupy an impregnable position. We have an open Bible and our pulpits are free. During the last ten years of his life, 1990, 1890 to 1900, he began to rely more heavily on his favorite son, Herbert. Now, one thing we could say about his children, none of them were particularly known for their, for their following after their father's footsteps in their, in their beliefs. Herbert uh, was a, a churchman, but he certainly held not to the beliefs of his father. But he was loyal, and his father looked upon him as being his favorite. And when he began to get there to the latter years of his life, he began to rely more heavily on this son, especially after the death of his third wife in 1889. Serious illness uh, took him in 1891, but he made a good recovery after that, still serving in his office as bishop. But by April of 80, 1899, it became obvious that he could not continue as bishop much longer. He wrote to the Archbishop of York telling him he had made up his mind to resign as of March 1st, 1900. He did retire and chose the seaside town of Lostoft as his place of retirement. But illness prevented him from arriving on the expected date of March 6th as he planned. And finally, ten days later, he arrived. But by this time, he was in no condition to enjoy the view. And the end came suddenly on June the 10th, 1900. At 2.15 p.m. on the Lord's Day, he went home to be with that same Lord. I'd like to read out of one biography of Ryle just to give you the last uh, accounts of what took place when he went to be with his Lord. It reads, On the Wednesday morning, a small crowd gathered at Lowstoff Station to pay its last respects. The huge oak-paneled coffin was put in a special funeral car attached to the 7.57 a.m. train for Liverpool. Arriving in Liverpool, the coffin containing the old Bible from which he had preached was taken to All Saints Childwall. And yet there were no crowds. Only the vicar and Bishop Royston were there to receive it. The ivy-clad church stood on the slope of a hill looking out south over the Mersey and into Cheshire. The bishop had known it well, for he had visited the grave of his wife there each week since she had died. The morning of the day of the funeral began gray and drizzly, but by the afternoon the weather had brightened up and people in their thousands came out from the center of Liverpool in the special trains. The service was quite simple. Archbishop, Archdeacon Taylor read the first lesson from Psalm 90. Rock of Ages, Ryle's favorite hymn, was sung. The second lesson was from 1 Corinthians 15, read by Archdeacon Madden. It had been planned to end the service by the graveside, but rain came on, and therefore, after the service in church, only the words of committal said by Bishop Royston and the benediction given by Bishop Shavas were said by the graveside. The body of J.C. Ryle with Bible clasped in his hands at last lay next to that of his third wife. On the gravestone were engraved two texts. The first was a reminder, was a reminder of the conversion which set him off on the Christian pilgrimage. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace are you saved through faith. 
The second testified that he had now finished that earthly pilgrimage. 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In a memorial sermon, Canon Hobson declared that few men in the 19th century did so much for God, for truth, and for righteousness among the English-speaking race and in the world as our late bishop. More simply, his successor, Bishop Shavas, described him as a man who lived so as to be missed. Well, we could sum up in saying that much could be said more about uh, John Charles Ryle. But simply to sum up, we could say that his ministerial career throughout was a, a ministry that was committed to evangelical doctrines. Though he lacked somewhat of a personality, uh, a pleasing personality, many people looked at him and thought he was very hard and harsh. But that was really, underneath all of that, there was a heart that, that yearned for Christ and yearned for his people, loving the masses of people that knew not Christ. And so it was possibly even by his stature itself and by the strong stance that he took when he preached and by the, by the refusal to be budged one inch from the truth that many people took him to be a hard man, but he was not a hard man. Many felt he remained mentally aloof at most times from people, but those who knew him best knew that he spent many, many hours talking to people concerning their souls. He was one who shared his evangelical convictions. And because of this, both his friends and his enemies respected him. Perhaps the key word in describing Ryle was that he was a father, a presbyter, and a bishop. He loved his family and his flock. His undoubted ability, his strong convictions, his commanding appearance, his faithfulness and his sincerity created respect in parsonages, parish churches, Exeter Hall, church congresses, St. George, and yes, as Bishop of Liverpool. Even those who were deeply opposed to his theology and were not consciously biased could find a certain respect for him in their hearts. The legacy that he has left behind for us today is primarily found in his books. These are just but a handful of the legacy that he's left to us. We've already referred to the expository thoughts on the Gospels that he wrote for the average Christian. Some of the other books I've referred to this morning about the book that he wrote when he was being confronted with the Keswick teaching, Holiness. You ought to really have that book. That's, that's almost a classic. Classic is right. It's Excellent, excellent book. Christian leaders of the 18th century. His view of men of that time that he looked to. Light from old times. Another one of his classic works. The Upper Room. Bringing a few truth, truths for the times. And one here that has a new title now. Some of you may have known it as Charges and Addresses. Collection of his writings now called No Uncertain Sound. And I guess we could close by saying that that's what was true of J.C. Ryle. There was no uncertain sound. All knew what he believed, both friend and foe. Let's pray. Our Father in Heaven, we do not come this day to elevate a man. We come not to place him upon a pedestal in which we would bow down before him, but we come to give thanks and praise to the God that he loved and worshipped. We thank you that through the course of history you have had men like J.C. Ryle who have stood for the truth and refused to be budged. And yes, though much could be said maybe about the personal character and we could always find things to pick about and to criticize, yet... We must say of him that he was one who remained firm to the end. And certainly he lived his life as one who would be missed. So help us 
in our day and age to avail ourselves of the legacy that he has left for us, that we might be taught, that we might be instructed by his writings that are so filled with your holy word. And so we do thank you for the time that we've had today to briefly look at this man, his life and his ministry. We give you thanks for him in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this week at the Saybrook Meeting House. We hope you've been blessed by today's podcast. Saybrook Ministries' mission is to provide didactic and devotional content from the Christian faith delivered to the saints, recovered and refined by the Protestant Reformation. Be sure to visit saybrookministries.org for continually updated Christian content designed to inspire and invigorate our imagination and intellect. Join us next week for another journey to the Saybrook Meeting House. Until then, may God bless you.